In this episode, I talk with a colleague on a surprisingly parallel path as mine, Jessica Kajowski, about why it is that people want the general American accent. But since we're in the same field, we really can't help but chatting about how much we love working with our clients, what we like about it, and not only those learning the general American accent for themselves, but also the teachers in our programs who we're mentoring. It's a really special peek behind the curtain of what it's like being an accent professional and how we're training future pronunciation specialists and accent coaches. I hope you enjoyed the talk as much as we did. I'm Bianca, your personal American accent coach, and I'm here to help you master an American accent in English because your voice is your choice when it comes to how you sound. I try to release a podcast episode every two weeks. And so you should really subscribe to whatever podcast platform you use so that you don't miss the newest episode. And by the way, if you want to see the full video of the episode, it's available at Accent Coach Bianca on YouTube. Now, let's get on with the show. I want to say thanks, Jess, so much for coming because I know we've been trying to schedule this for a long time and life just keeps getting in the way. (laughs) I'm really excited today to talk to you. Thank you. I'm excited to speak with you as well. (laughs) And we're going to talk about why people want General American or sometimes we call it Gen M, right? Yes. Yeah. So maybe can you start us off maybe by saying like what what brought you here just in general? Did you used to be an English teacher? Did you used to be a speech therapist? Did you used to do both? What's your background a little bit? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a speech pathologist. So I have my master's in speech pathology. I did my internship and my externship in speech with as a speech pathologist. I actually worked as a speech pathologist for about three months. So I had done all this schooling and got done all this work and spent all this time getting licensed and certified. And I realized three months into it that I really, I was not suited to be a traditional speech pathologist. Mm-hmm. So I happened to, at that point, I just graduated, I just finished. So going back to school for something else just didn't feel right. So I was living in New York City at the time and my job as a speech pathologist, it was, it's called early intervention. So you go into homes and you work with children who are birth, it's ages birth to three. So I loved working with the children, but you're in, I was in Queens driving around, having to find I don't know, seven to eight parking spots per day. And you carry your big sack of toys into the house and you have, it was just a lot. But I happened to find, I saw an advertisement and this was in 2000, the year 2000. So a long time ago, it was an advertisement in a magazine for speech pathologists, but it was for the largest private practice in the country of speech pathologists who specialized in what was called at the time accent elimination. That's what it was called. Mm -hmm. I would not call it that today. It's actually not appropriate or accurate, but that's what it was called. Mm -hmm. So there was a private practice in Manhattan and that's where I started doing this work. So technically I was and still am a speech pathologist, but I've only done traditional speech pathology mm. work. I only mm-hmm. did that for about three, maybe six months before mm-hmm. I was lucky enough to find something that kind of integrated some of my training, although not much. We get a very little in my education as a speech pathologist, I had about 30 minutes mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. what was called accent modification mm-hmm. training. Mm-hmm. And but that's a small part of what we do. So yeah. That's mm-hmm. how I got here. Wow. That's yeah. What I've been doing since then. And I think maybe people today forget or don't realize that back in the day for us, it's it, it wasn't so easy as it is now with all the social media to know what your opportunities are out there. You In the past, you'd graduate with a thing and you'd start in that job and surprise you, maybe it's not a good fit for you, but you had just spent right. whatever, four or six years doing that thing, preparing for this thing. So the courage I think it takes to say, you know what? after just three or six months, like, I know that this isn't for me. And to do something about it is one thing. And then to just happen to see a, an advertisement like that, it's and it just like all those puzzle pieces fit together, I feel like in a way in the past that they don't today, right? You're not just walking around and seeing advertisement, you're scrolling on your phone and 32 different advertisements That's for things. So different, I think today. It's yeah. true. I actually mm-hmm. didn't think of it that way. But you're right. It, the timing just all came together, I guess. Mm-hmm. You're right. And it's, yeah, just so different today. And can I ask you to a question that probably you get pretty often, or it seems basic to you, but I think me and a lot of other people might not know, what's the difference between a speech pathologist and a speech therapist, if there is one? There's no difference. Okay. It's just a, the preferred 
terminology is actually speech language pathologist. Mm -hmm. So I think it was one of those things where, um, and, and I'm hoping, yeah, I, I think it's still, that's what it is. But it was, uh, they had been called speech therapists up until, a, I think around the early 90s, they mm -hmm. decided that didn't really reflect what we did. And so they changed it. But it's crazy that the, the career of a speech pathologist or the scope of practice of a speech pathologist, it covers everything from fluency which used to be called stuttering, swallowing disorders, apraxia of speech, articulation disorders, traumatic brain injury. It's such mm -hmm. a huge scope that you really have to find an area and you're expected to know all of that. It's so much. It's and then people find their specialization and, and work toward that. Mm -hmm. But it's a really huge scope of practice yeah. for speech pathologists. Yeah, it's yeah in terms, at least when you first probably graduate, a, a little about a lot of things and then maybe exactly. you'll find your niche. Or maybe like you'll, exactly. you'll say, I don't think any of these are quite right. I've only right. been on the other side. I don't know if I told you this. I had a brain tumor when I, acoustic neuroma. Oh, no. when, yeah, about okay. 10, 15 years ago. And so I'm, I'm deaf in this ear. And at, just after surgery, I couldn't swallow. I had facial paralysis right. all down this one left side of my face. And so I had a speech therapist for quite a while. And I still don't have quite the same smile on this side as I do. But my interaction with speech therapists or pathologists was just that, right? That's the only time I had that in my life. And I think a lot of people have it more in the early years or in the later years, or if there's some kind of traumatic brain injury, car crashes, things like that. It seems to be one of those things yes. you don't think about until you need it. So you need it. Mm -hmm. That's true. A lot of people yeah. don't know. And my, I still use the, I, not so much now, but when I was at the private practice, I was there for 13 years, something mm -hmm. like that. We still used the title speech pathologist and people would be a little bit scared off by it. Mm. I would have students who had not heard of that term and they're like, do I have to give blood or something? What is a speech <laughs> pathologist? But so yeah, it, it does describe the field, but mm. there's so many areas of the field that yeah. it makes it tough. And I feel like the word pathology is a big, scary word, whereas the word therapist is a little bit more helpful and approachable. <laughs> like, I'm here to help it you. Is. Yeah. Yes. And then yeah, I noticed the also, difference. oh, sorry. I was going to say, I noticed also on this, you have, so often they'll have SLP and then is it CCC at the end? What does that CCC stand for? Yeah. The, the CCC stands for Certificate of Clinical Competence. Mm -hmm. So that is a, it's a licensure from our, we're, to work as a speech pathologist, there and, and I hope I get this correct because I don't, I'm not so much in that world anymore, mm -hmm. but to work as a speech pathologist, I believe that you have to be licensed by the National Board, which is the American Speech Language Hearing Association, and also a state board, which would mm. be the state where you are providing service and the state where you're, it gets very complicated, where your client is living. Mm -hmm. That CCC is awarded by ASHA. Okay, this okay. I do know. The mm -hmm. CCC is awarded by our national governing board. It's just to, uh, it's a certification to prove that we've gotten this much education, that we've done this amount of observation hours and practicum, clinical practicum supervised mm -hmm. by another speech pathologist. Mm -hmm. So it's just, yeah, a okay. license, a national okay. license. Got it. That's what that CCC there is. There are tons of, you have to pass a there's a lot of guidelines to meet. Mm -hmm. And then you have to keep, it also ensures that we stay up to date on our continuing education. So we have to get earn a certain number of continuing or professional development hours every three years to mm -hmm. maintain our certification. Yeah, and this leads me to ask you more about, so we know your background, where you're coming from. We're gonna talk a little bit about why people now want general American accent. We're gonna get more into accent. Thinking about, I'm thinking about how I got into this work too, because there's, it seems to be there's about three paths that you come into accent coaching or whatever you wanna call it, uh, pronunciation, teaching, whatever you wanna call it. And, and it seems to be, number one, you used to be an English teacher. And you want to mm -hmm. specialize, right? And that's where I came from, right? I used to be an English teacher. I wanted to specialize. I saw this niche and, and I'm really good at it and I really enjoy it. So that's me. Some people so like fun. you, which is I think the people that you help are coming from the world of speech pathology. And then they mm -hmm. see this as a niche, right? And something that they didn't maybe learn about in school so much or enough to know about it back then. 
And then sometimes you get people from the world of theater or, or acting in general, voice acting, things like that, who say, oh, I want to specialize in this. So at least that's what I've seen. Are, those are the three paths where people are coming from. Not all, but in, in that case. So I represent one. You represent the other. And the, at the end of the day, we're helping people who are looking to get an additional accent. And a lot of those people are really going for what we call general American, or sometimes people call it standard American. And so let's now talk about why that is. Like, why is this such a popular, important thing, right? And because in, in all the Englishes, there's so many different accents and they're all very valid. What, yeah, what's your take on, let's first of all, kind of define what we mean when we say general American, and then we can talk a little bit more about it. Okay, so this is a really complicated topic. And it, so it's changed over the years. When I started teaching, there was, it was called the standard American accent. I don't, li I don't like that term at all because saying that there is a standard accent implies that other accents are non-standard or less than. So I don't like that term, but that's what it was called. And it was very much the right, this is the right way, this is the wrong way. This accent used to be taught in, it was taught in, it still is taught in theater and acting schools. It was taught in public schools. I had students who would tell me stories about being in Catholic school and they're, they're in New York City and if they didn't pronounce their R's, they said teacher instead of teacher, I mean, they would get their knuckles wrapped. This was in the 60s. So there was a time when this accent was considered correct. But and and can I just stop you there? I'm sure you know as well, in the 60s, a New York accent it ha was non-rhotic. Like that was, the, we could even say the standard of New York City accent was to not pronounce the R's, but then the school system maybe decided on a different standard or a particular teacher. And then you get that clash and you get this hierarchy of where power meets language. Exactly. And you start with, then you have prejudices and things that, that come into that too. But yeah, I, would, I just wanted to pause you for a second to say it's not just other speakers of other languages who are having English as a first language. There's tons of prejudice Absolutely. within the U.S., right? Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, not so, and it's a lot better now. It's much different now. And I think as time goes on, that will continue. And I think that's a great thing. But it's good to look at how you have to look at the history of the accent. I think it all started with, and there, there are probably many different influences, but I would say old Hollywood the, it's the entertainment industry and the communication industries, broadcasters mm. and that kind of thing. There mm. were people trained in this accent and they taught it to other people. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing about this accent is, here's the thing. No one speaks this accent naturally. No one grows up speaking this accent. Even today, what I call reluctantly a general American accent doesn't exist in the real world. It doesn't mm -hmm. exist. It's mm -hmm. taught by a certain... It, it's taught by people who have said this is the way the sound should be pronounced. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, the people who selected these rules, so, and you can go way back. There was a, a woman who was very famous in the, I think it was in the 40s and 50s. She was way back. Edith Skinner, and she was mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. um, particular about this right and wrong. And they chose the sounds based on how, for vowels, for example, how the, the placement of the mouth that would be most resonant and would keep nasality out of the sounds mm -hmm, mm -hmm. adding and we can to get more specific about some of the qualities but some of the accent was chosen to maximize the sound of the human voice mm -hmm. to some extent and mm -hmm. to maximize clarity of speech to some extent Yes, definitely becomes this thing that is hierarchical and has this right and wrong factor. But but if you look at the accent, you can see why whoever invented it or all the people that were in on inventing it chose the sounds and, and concepts and features that they did. Mm -hmm. So this accent and this even the, the general, accent, general American accent has changed over time. So if you hear the way people spoke in movies in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, even if you look at some of the people in the 80s and 90s and definitely people in the theater in the 80s and 90s and even now, there's a change. There's a change mm. in the way Joan Crawford and Betty Davis spoke in their movies. They were talking like this and they had mm -hmm. this accent and this, mm -hmm. this certain 
rhythm pattern versus someone like Meryl Streep or Julia Roberts or even actresses today. Although yeah. actresses today tend to have a little more regionalism, which is a good thing. My point is, even though there are rules to this general American accent, it still changes with time, mm. just the way any accent changes. Absolutely. Did yeah. I go off on a tangent? Not yeah, at all. But <laughs> I, my point is, the reason we teach this accent is because it has rules, it's made up, it's invented, and um, it changes less than real accents and dialects that are mm. living, breathing things that mm -hmm. are being used out in the world. Mm -hmm. There are rules but it's harder to pinpoint those rules because they're changing a lot more quickly. Mm -hmm. So every accent represents a point in time. Yes. So with an actor, I can say, okay, the character is from this region and born in this region and they're this many years old. Okay, I know mm -hmm. which accent we can pick. Mm -hmm. But for someone who speaks English as an alternative language or second, third, fourth, fifth language, when they want to be more easily understood in their daily conversations, they don't have those parameters. Mm. So that's mm. why we can say to them, okay, we've got this accent that's, that a lot of people are familiar with that has a bunch of rules that I can teach you that you can count on and that will help you communicate more easily in your daily conversations. Mm -hmm. So it's not about being best or better mm. or mm -hmm. elevated. It's yeah. this is going to help you function in your daily conversations. And if you don't have a preference, this is the one I would recommend. Yes. If you don't have a preference, exactly. Or maybe you don't have much skill in learning, learning either accents or languages, or you don't have that ear yet. Like you said, here's some rules. We can start with this and then see what you think, see what you notice, see what you feel. Right. And then I always find this to be true is that most people, when they come to me, they say, oh, I want standard American. I want general American accent. And then they discover along the way, that's not what they needed the whole time. What they needed was to build their confidence or their comprehensibility, or just, they just needed the tools to be able to select it and pick it apart and say, okay, I know, now I know what general American is, but I'm going to make my own choices. And this is what I want my voice to sound like. I want it to represent the fact that, I don't know, my parents are from Ghana and I want to keep some of these things in there because that's who I am. And so I think it's, I think it's wonderful because it's a wonderful place to start. And most people think it's their finish line, but really we, we usually realize that it's a starting point more than anything. I don't know if you feel the same way about it, but yeah, that's I, what I, I find. I do. And I love that you brought up the confidence factor because mm. I'm constantly preaching this to the teachers in my training program. At the end of the day, I think that's the most important thing that we teach. I think mm -hmm. that's the most important thing that I give to my students is being there, listening to them and saying, yes, I, I that was amazing. You mm -hmm. sound great. Yes, I could hear the emotions that you were trying to convey. Yes, that presentation made me want to sign up and be your work with you. And it would be it, it's so simplistic to say that we're almost, we are more than a conversational partner, mm. but I would say that I'm a conversational partner that really knows how to listen, that really knows how to keep you speaking, that can really guide you to have speech that's more dynamic and more persuasive and more, but at the end of the day, it really is, you sound great. Go out and do that mm -hmm. and keep doing that. And then I'll be here to help you if there's something you're unsure about. Yeah. It, 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 it's confidence is it above anything else. I think that's why our students come to us. And they don't, maybe you don't even know it at first, right? It could be, I know that I don't know some things and I need some professional help. And I, or I know that I, I know there's something wrong with my TH sound, right? They might know that they have a very specific thing. Oh my, I don't think my rhythm's very good or people don't laugh at my jokes and I can't be uh, like sarcastic right, and ironic. <laughs> like They think I'm being mean and I'm really not. And so yeah. I think a lot of that comes down to feeling like we can make that connection. And I'm really glad that you brought up like, intonation with that too. And the style of presenting and things like that and making sure that people are listening to what we're saying saying and that our how we're saying it isn't really getting in the way. There's that thing that like, oh, accents can speak louder yes. than words sometimes, and which is absolutely true. I don't want to discount any prejudice or bias that exists out there. But I think even us, even as native speakers, we can always be, we can always go the extra mile with our expressions, with our how we speak. And and there's there are always choices, right? Maybe today I, I do want to sound flat because I'm feeling flat and that's okay. Or mm -hmm. sometimes I want you to get the joke, but I don't want you to get the joke. So I have to really negotiate that intonation and how I do it. But having those tools 
is, I think, giving you the power. It's, it's empowering to people to say, oh, yes, when I want to do this, I can do this. And I might not want to do it. But being able to decide when you want to when you want to pull out your peacock feathers and when you want to blend like a chameleon, <laughs> like is, it's all sure. up to you in the end. Yeah, which is why I really I like mean, it. So mm-hmm, go ahead. Yeah. And every speaker needs a safe space to try it out because mm-hmm. it, it, it feels strange to speak in a different way. We've got these habits. You've, every mm-hmm. way you speak is a habit. So when you break out of that mold and speak in a different pattern with a different style, it, it feels really strange. That's mm-hmm. why I love, I all, again, the teachers in my program, I, I, re- I require, mm-hmm. I show them and teach them how to teach different dialects, not because I expect them to use them or teach them, but I want you to practice using a general American Southern accent. Mm -hmm. And if it feels weird to you to speak that way, that's how your students feel every time they they come into a session with you. It's Mm -hmm. uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and you have to practice to make it not to make it comfortable, to turn it into a habit. Some of, again, what we do is just having that space safe space for people to try out, okay, this is the intonation I'm going to use when I'm annoyed. It feels Mm -hmm. really weird and it sounds weird, but you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to practice it a few times and then I'm going to make it my own and then I can go out and use it. Yeah. It might feel weird, but if it's accomplishing a goal and it works, I don't think it's going to work. I'm not going to do that, right? So I don't get my goal (laughs) accomplished. But then when I do it with some weird feeling kind of effort, right? But then I see that it gets the job done. Then I'm going to want to say, ah, I'll do that. Okay, I'll do that again. I will stick my tongue out a little farther for that TH. I don't like it. It feels rude to me. It feels weird, but (laughs) apparently it works. So I guess I'm going to do that. And yeah, going up and down with your voice more than you might be be used to in your normal range. You say, ah, but that's how you, that's how you hit that sarcasm. Oh, you really want to be funny? That's how you do it, right? You did it. You, maybe you didn't like it, but do it 10 more times and I guarantee it's going to start to feel a little bit more normal there. Yeah, absolutely. And then making that an automatic kind of when the brain and the ears and the mouth all connect and all those things come out automatically. To me, that's just that's a beautiful sight. Right? And you say, oh, you, you see that? You just did it. You totally did that. Were you thinking about it? No, I wasn't thinking about it at all. <laughs> Fireworks. It makes it all worth it. That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. That is the best. I really love that. Yeah, because we were, we we're talking about like general American accent and how there's like, this is also changing in broadcasting, right? We have this, sometimes we call it a quote, neutral accent, right? It, it makes you sound like you come from everywhere and nowhere at the same time and that you, you can blend in. But it, And we think we want that. But in the end of the day, I think we all want to be us. We have to figure out how that is in a different culture, in a different language. And like you said, even just from north, going north to south, and it can feel really uncomfortable. And putting ourselves in the shoes of our clients as teachers, that's something that's really, I think, valuable probably for the people that you work with. Totally. So tell us a little bit about that. If we, Oh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. No, that's all. That's all I wanted to say. A different perspective. (laughs) And it, it, it makes you a better teacher. Yeah, absolutely. And I was, and maybe we can pause for a second and talk a little bit about what teachers come to you, let's say prospective teachers, are they mostly also from the speech pathology world? And how do you, because you touched on it a little bit, maybe you can talk a little bit more about it, how you, let's say, frame this kind of work and what that they need, because you came from that same place. Yeah. So my program, the people that, that join my program tend to be, it's a mix. It's exactly what you described. Speech pathologists, ESL teachers, and actors. That's mm-hmm decides and those are the people that are a great fit to do this work they each have strengths and weaknesses if I have to be honest so Mm. the strength of the speech pathologist is that we really know the placements of each sound and how to describe what to do with your tongue teeth lips nasality voicing vocal cords that kind of thing I I Mm -hmm. think we have an advantage there but speech pathologists get a little too hung up on that Mm -hmm. and not so much on just imitate what I'm doing. Because really mm-hmm. we learn accents and intonation and rhythm. A lot of what we learn by hearing it. Speech pathologists tend to really want data, hard data. where We have to accuracy, accuracy rates because we're used to having to report to insurance companies, which we don't for this work. So the, the data piece of it for speech pathologists tends to hold them back a little bit. Mm. ESL teachers do a wonderful job. Their hang up is 
they're so much more qualified than they realize. Mm. So they don't have the, they don't know how to teach the placements of the sounds, but they have so many other skills that are perfect. Their natural instinct for this is wonderful because they've worked with so many people. They know the pronunciation challenges. Mm. They know the challenges with rhythm. They're just, they feel very unsure about how to explain it to another person. Mm -hmm. That's that easily learned. Yeah, so yeah. ESL teachers, yeah, they, they're wonderful. They just need someone to tell them, You're, you can do this, the, the mm -hmm. confidence. Mm -hmm. Actors. The actors tend to be really good on both. Again, I think if I had to say, it would be the explanation. They feel that they need to learn the anatomy, the placement, mm -hmm. the background of where everything comes from. Oh, here's another thing. Everyone thinks that they need to know the specifics of every accent and dialect to right. even start teaching. Oh, right, so they feel, right. I can't, I don't know what people, what makes up a Midwestern accent or a Queens accent or a New Jersey accent. I don't know mm -hmm. anything about that. I just know the way I sound. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's something that you should, you'll learn as time goes on. But when you first start teaching, you really don't need to know all that much about different accents and dialects to help people go back to some of the reasons we talked about that people come to us confidence intonation expressing yourself more clearly mm -hmm. you don't need to know you don't even need to know much about the general american accent to, mm -hmm. to start working on that mm -hmm. so, yeah I, I think that every every background as far as where people are coming from has their own challenges and advantages. Absolutely. Yeah. And I love all those things that you said. The thing that makes me connect them all seems to be passion, right? If, you, if you're already here and you're like, I'm thinking about doing this as work so that I can help other people. If you probably, if you already have that passion, you probably have everything you need, right? You, because you are interested and you're going to go and find out the things that you don't know. And I'm sure this is probably true of you too. I find things I don't know every day. Like I'm in a class or in a club with people and they'll say, and I'll say, that sounds like it might have, say, I might have secondary stress here. Let's take a moment and check. I don't know. So I suspect, Absolutely. let me highlight this. Let's just open up the dictionary I think I know and check. The answer. I don't need to know all the answers. I think answers. it's so important. I need to know That's where to find so the answers. Yeah. We don't have all the answers and new things come up all the time. So I, yes, I'm constantly learning about different characteristics of different accents, but also new ways because different cues work with different students. Mm -hmm. So I'll find a way to get a student to do what I want them to do that I haven't done before. And then I can use it with other people. Mm. So you're right. It's a, it's, we're constantly learning, yeah, we're constantly yeah. adding. And, I, and yeah. I think one of the reasons I like to do things more in a live one-on-one -on -one club kind of class atmosphere is that I learn so much from all my other people. For example, yeah, they'll say, Somebody will make a mistake. For example, yesterday, so the word close, C-L-O-S-E, close, C-L-O-S-E, right? Close and close, as in close the door. And this person, yeah, it was an adverb. So it was C-L-O-S-E-L-Y, I believe, closely. And they were saying close, okay. closely. And I thought, oh, maybe they're thinking of the word close as in close the door, where that S is voiced and it sounds more like a Z, right? Close, right. close the door. And I thought, oh, maybe that's where this mistake is coming from. And then this person explained to me, oh no, in Russian, if you have a letter S between two vowels, you voice it. Ah, okay, that's why you're making this mistake with the S's. But for example, your V's are not sounding like F's and vice versa, right? So it's not a general voicing issue. It's this because of the first, the other language. And then somebody else started doing it. And I thought, wait a minute, they speak, they don't speak Russian, they speak Spanish. And I said, correct me if I'm wrong, you don't have this thing going on in Spanish where if an S is between two vowels, you don't make it to a Z sound. And they're like, no, but actually, but Catalan is my second language. And in Catalan, we do. Huh, <laughs> okay. See, so I'm learning I love things that. constantly. I, I thought it and was then one you thing. Notes of that. I make notes of that and that's uh -huh. how I just, then you can use it again. I, mm -hmm. Those are, I think those are the best moments mm -hmm. just to, because accents make sense. One of my students refer, he's, cause I'll work on different dialects, but, but I have one student in particular who is a Spanish speaker, but his American accent is flawless with a script. Mm -hmm. He's an actor mm -hmm. and he can mm -hmm. do a, a, several different American dialects and he describes it as copy and paste. Every 
different accent. It's simply copy paste. All this, there's this set of sounds. We copy and paste them into different dialects and accents. And I feel the same way. That's how it works. Totally. So once you figure out where to copy and paste Mm -hmm, for a specific mm -hmm. speaker, then you can help them more easily. Totally. Yeah. Or you see those same, we might call them mistakes or challenges being repeated. But if you're looking to, let's say you're an actor and you're looking to put on a certain accent for a role and you want that hint of this or that hint of that to show the character's backstory, then you need to be familiar with what those things are, like like the SZ thing that yes. I was just mentioning, right? You'd know that. And then you can overdo it a little bit and then the accent in the movie is going to sound a little bit too much. And I, I feel like that's where that actors really excel there is the picking and choosing, the copying and the pasting of those things and making those decisions. Which, yes, Mm-hmm. Absolutely. What mm-hmm. to use and, and what to, to leave out. What are the most common substitutions and features? And also you have to recognize even within normal speech, there are incon- inconsistencies. So mm-hmm. actors, and that's a, with actors, it's also the confidence piece of it where you say, okay, this is what we're doing. But if you make a mistake and you don't do this certain feature or substitution that we want, any person who speaks this accent naturally has some inconsistencies. So that's okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's part of it too. Yeah. Even like you or I, sometimes they'll say, oh, do you say this or do you say this? I'll say, if it's a Tuesday, I might say it this way. And if it's a Wednesday, I might say it this way. <laughs> and I never that's thought about answer. it until you asked me. Because <laughs> often there's more than one acceptable pronunciation of things. And yes. how are you supposed to know which one is more common overall or more common in this area or in this age group or in this socioeconomic group, right? So you wouldn't know that by just looking at a dictionary, but with some practice, with some exposure, with noticing, you'd say, okay, I know both are cool, but I think I'll, I think I'll do this one here. And maybe it's not even a, a conscious choice anymore. I'm glad you brought that up because that brings us back to the general American accent or the what was the formerly known as the standard American <laughs> accent. Because even though it's not used and it's it changes over time and maybe it's not perfect, th- that is a place where I can say to my students, the general American accent says either is a British pronunciation and either is an American pronunciation. Mm -hmm, Does mm -hmm. that mean it's right and wrong? No. Does that mean the dictionary is going to agree with me? No. But it's nice when we're working with the student to have some kind of authority, I don't know, to Mm. say like this says or this rule or this set of rules says that we pronounce it this way. Now, even within that context, there are always going to be exceptions and places where you could argue what is I don't even, I don't like to use right and wrong. What is the most popular and what you should say? But Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as far as any kind of framework, that standard or formerly known as standard, but general American accent does give us those answers to give Mm -hmm, our students. mm -hmm. So at least we can put their mind at ease. Yeah. Or at least they can make the choice of people where I live say it this way, but the general American accent says to say it this way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm going to go with my local pronunciation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay, absolutely. Good. We've yeah. answered the question and we can move on to something else. Yeah, there's, That's I think that comes back to that enough. confidence thing too. Like we, we, I guess it's human nature, right? We want to know what's the answer, teacher? What's the, don't know, the put answer. away your red pen. Tell me what I'm supposed to say. And we have this like need of this confirmation to know what's the best choice. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But when we start judging things and saying right and wrong, I think that's where we usually get into some sticky areas. But I think what do most people say most of the time is a great place to start. And that's how I like to think of general American. What do most people say most of the time if we average it all out? It's a good starting point. Yeah, I think that's, it comes down to competence and confidence and just empowerment, I think again is here's how I look it up. I will demonstrate. This is the dictionary I like. This is what I like to do. I'm a big fan of IPA. I'm not saying you should learn all the symbols, but pick up what's useful to you. And then that's going to maybe make your life a little bit easier. So I like to empower them as much as possible, not just other teachers who want to teach this, but also learners too. So I think part of that process is we're not always right. Here's how I like to do it. You can do this too. And you can just run with it once. At least that's how I feel about it. No, I agree. I say that to my students. I want you to be your own coach. I'm teaching you everything I know as it comes up so that you can do your own You can be your own speech coach and then Mm. come back to me to make sure it's all still happening. But that's (laughs) your choice. But I agree. I I think you have to understand a concept and you have to trust that it's what people are really doing 
before you'll, you're comfortable doing it yourself. Mm. So there has mm-hmm. to be a set, a yes and a no, a right and a wrong. Mm-hmm, Although mm-hmm. I then you can get into maybe. <laughs> then you can get into it depends. There are always exceptions. Yeah, and that can be yeah. another another the gray area is scoring. huge. Yeah, but we start out with black it and is. white, and then we move into that very fine gray area. And that's something that I really love too. Is when people start asking those questions, and they say, "But," and you say, "Uh huh." Now you're getting it. Yeah, absolutely. You're not wrong. You're totally right about that. Let's talk more about this. So yeah, I like planting that seed of passion into other people, and yeah, just nerding out on that for a little bit. So coming back to General American, okay, we're saying, why is this important, right? Number one, it's familiar, as you said, it's something that we are gonna encounter a lot, and if not exactly, obviously, as we said, variations. And enough to, I'm gonna say, ah, okay, got it, that's what he's saying, right? Whether I go north, south, east, west, center, country, city, it's gonna be familiar enough to where I can pick up the other things, both receptively and productively. And I wanted you to maybe talk a little bit about more, uh, a little bit more about how General American or Gen M can regulate your speech and improve the sound of your voice. Because I think coming from speech pathology, this will be really interesting to hear about from you. Sure. Just a, a couple of different, th- I'll just give you a couple of examples. One thing that I work on a lot, and you probably do as well with students, is a lot of people who, who come from other language backgrounds are not in their native languages, they don't voice final consonants. Mm. So at the ends of words, Ds will sound like Ts and Zs, it should sound like a Z, but it ends up sounding like an S. S and Z is a really good example because you can actually feel the difference. When you say S, you put your hand here, you don't feel anything. Z, you feel that vibration. Z, that Z, that vibration is resonance. It helps your voice. It gives a fuller sound to your voice. It can take the pitch a little lower, which is usually a good thing. And it helps your voice carry further. So if you're not using those, see, now I'm doing it more than I was before. This is something that I work on with all, anyone who wants to sound better. And I worked on it myself because I tend to speak quickly. Buzzing your Z's, adding that voicing, And there are other consonants that do this at the ends of words, but it adds that resonance to your voice so you have a more powerful, more confident sounding voice. It can also slow you down a bit, which is a good thing too. The vowel a is another one. So in, I love the vowel a, it's my favorite vowel to talk about because every accent and dialect does something different with it. In a true general American accent or what formerly known as standard, the rule is to pronounce a, ah, but to not let any nasality assimilate into it. So the back of the tongue is supposed to be kept really low. And this is, this is comfortable for people in words like last and have and had maybe. But when it comes before a nasal sound, our, the sounds where we need air in our nose are m, n, and ing. So when a comes before one of those sounds, people anticipate the nasality. So they let the nasality in too soon. So we end up hearing can and dance and champagne, right? In a true general American accent, and, and this is going to sound outdated to people because it is not so many people do this naturally anymore. We're supposed to keep that open and say Mm. can and dance and champagne. Mm. Keep it. Now, why do we do this? Why was that chosen to stay open? Anything that goes into your nose, any sound that goes into your nose is absorbed. It's there's soft tissue inside. It's absorbed. It's sucked up. So the sound is not there. That resonance that we had here with Z, that's gone. The sound's not going to carry as far. It's not going to be as full and confident as it would be if you kept that the air from going in there. So we close up. So t- I'm not going to go too get too specific particular about the placement, but basically keeping the tongue low, there's a little flap in the back that closes off when you do that. It keeps the air out of your nose and pushes it out of your mouth. So the vowel has a better sound, carries further, and doesn't have what's called nasality, right? Nasality Mm -hmm. would be if I were speaking with a nasal voice, everything's going through my nose and I would sound like this all the time. So we don't, most people don't do that everywhere, but a lot of people will do that on that a vowel. And by eliminating that, 
they'll have a better sounding voice. Mm-hmm. So Absolutely. not to get too technical, but that's <laughs> just to illustrate why the this the rules of this accent can help you with more than pronunciation. Absolutely. And that that ah sound, even when you first did it without the yeah. nasals, right? I can I you said you were in New York. I don't know how long you've spent in New York City, like most of your life or years and years. So I'm in Pittsburgh. I was in I started working. I moved to New York right after graduating and I stayed there until 2015 when my okay. daughter was born. Mm-hmm. So now I'm in Pittsburgh. Okay. So my real accent and I when I started working, I actually had to change my accent, which I want to, I wanted to do because when I moved to New York, I'm from southwestern Pennsylvania, right? Mm-hmm. Near Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. And people in New York kept asking me where are you? What part of the South are you from? Are you from Alabama? Are you? And I could not. I'm like, it's. I'm not. There's nothing wrong with having. Yeah, of course. A Southern accent, uh-huh. but I wasn't from the South, and it would just throw. I'm like, what are you talking about? Mm-hmm. Because this particular accent, it does. Pittsburgh is. It's a very specific accent. Mm-hmm. Pittsburgh would be the closest to to what I sounded like. It does sound a little bit twangy on vowels, and we do things like ah instead of I. Mm -hmm, Right. mm -hmm. So there were components of it, but I'm not from the South. So it just felt weird to me. But and then I had to change it for work because Mm -hmm. I had to have that a certain sound. Yeah. Um, yeah. What was I talking about? Oh, I was saying I was going to ask how long you had been in New York City, because even people think, oh, here's a sound and it's very standard. It's very it's here's the mark I want to hit. But again, it's just a point to begin on, because if I listen really carefully to your A sound and my A ah sound, I can tell that my tongue is a bit more forward than yours, for example, right? And maybe that's because I teach it so often. I, I tend to overdo it sometimes because I, I overshoot the mark to hit the mark kind of thing. And But I noticed, I was, that's why I was going to ask, how much time did you spend there? Because I grew up in upstate New York, right? Then I moved down to okay. Philly for many years, and I have friends really here in Mexico like, yeah who are from like Western New York, right? And out near Buffalo and things like that. And it could be an age difference, but sometimes he says things and I'm like, really, are you putting me on right now? Are you just like fishing right now? And he will say things in a way that I'm like, is that really your natural accent? Or are you also assimilating because we're both here in Mexico and we're both trying to speak more standard and things like that. So I can, what I want to say is I can even hear it in you and people sh- can start to notice that among us, there's even variations between different how different coaches yes. speak. And when you can start to hear that, wow, like I'm so proud of people I work with when they're like, was yes. that kind of more like an eh as in bed? And I'll be like, yes. And probably right. because if I'm saying ah, eh, like cat, but there's an end there like can, you might be flattening a little bit. Your jaw might be closing it up in anticipation, as you said. And so it might be more like eh rather than ah, or it might, as you said, be in that soft tissue and it's sounding a little bit smothered a little bit and unclear That's in that way. That's a good way to describe it, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So yeah, so to say like your example is perfect, it's something that always seems to come up, this kind of what we call allophonic variation, and these things that you're not even going to see, for example, a different symbol in the dictionary for these two A's. You're just not going to see it. it. Exactly. It's so true. And I'm with you. I love, I truly feel that most of my students could te- could do what we do. They know so much about it. They get mm-hmm. to a point where they're so good at hearing things. And I heard this and I was watching TV and did I heard mm-hmm. this person and he sounded like this. They get so good about yeah. these little specific things that, you know, that, what, here's the thing, feature by feature, they don't matter so much and they are nitpicky. Yeah. But when you put them all together, they do make a difference. And so speaking as someone who did change their accent and did get a lot of comments, I know it's much different when someone um, comes into English from a different language, but Mm. I felt very self-conscious about Mm -hmm. the way I spoke naturally. So it's very nice to have some control over that. Yes, And it it does help you feel more confident about everything. I'm nervous, but I hear either things I know I can do that help me sound the way I want to sound and present myself in the way I want to present myself. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. I have some control over it. That was really helpful for me. And I know a lot of my students say that too, whether it comes out the way you want it to or not, just having that control over and having the knowledge of what to do can be really 
empowering. Yeah, that to me, that's what it comes down to. The whole idea of English is another language of mine. And I'm at the point where I should probably pick an accent, right? I don't have to, but I feel like I should. Which one am I going to choose? Why General American? Clearly, like Hollywood, right? Media is a big influence there. But yeah. also, like, I think what we've discovered here is, yeah, it's familiar. Yeah, it's a standard, right? Yeah, it's got some history behind it. But it's also the idea of it's just a tool to start me off. It's a springboard to where I can go as deep into this as I want to. And and I, nobody says that I have to, too. But the more I learn, the more kind of like control I have, as you said, and, and power I have, and which results in confidence, right? Confidence is the end result of all of these things. Because sometimes people will come to me, like what you just said, and they're like, Did I, I just heard this on the thing. I think I was hearing this. And there, there's some self-doubt <laughs> there. And I'll listen to it. And I'm like, nope. You're right. That's exactly what you heard. <laughs> and so just knowing that, I think, makes us all better communicators. It makes us build bridges where there weren't before. It's less us and them. And it's more how, because I'm always, we're all different people with different people, right? Like I am like a sister and a cousin and a friend and a, and a girlfriend. And we, you are different people with different people. So just as much as you change your behavior, you can change little tiny things in your voice if you're aware of them. To me, that's what it all comes down to. That's why General American. That's a good point. The awareness mm -hmm. and, and making the choices that you feel represent the way you want to sound. No, And, mm -hmm. and I agree with you. No one's telling you to do it. And I don't like any sort of, because there is advertising, there is messaging out there that sort of makes it seem that people should be doing this or have to do this or mm. to succeed you must but at the end of the day it boils down to I, I feel good sounding this way I like the way I sound in this video when I watch mm -hmm. when I listen back to what we're doing right now I'm not, I know well, maybe I will cringe at certain things but, <laughs> but overall I like to hear the sound of my voice mm -hmm. that's and that's what I want for my students too so yeah when we can get to that point mm -hmm. I know we're doing what we need to be doing. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's a great place to end on too, is to say this is, this should be a positive experience, right? This is something that yes. it, it can come from a negative place sometimes because we can't change the work culture that we're in. We can't change what other people say to us and how that makes us feel sometimes. We can't change the world, but we can feel better about ourselves. Yeah. And if that means like changing certain things, and if that means getting some help at the beginning to do that, then by all means, I'm really sad that it exists in a way because of this prejudice and things like that too, because we just can't accept how each other speaks as long as we're comprehensible. But on the other hand, I feel really happy and proud that I can give people the tools that at the end of the day, make them feel better. Absolutely true. And I am happy that people are more, oh, now are more accepting. It mm -hmm. was very different. Even 25 years ago, I mentioned that when I started. So I've seen a lot more acceptance and, and I, I trust that. I hope that continues. I, I think it's a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm, um, to mm -hmm. stop the judgments, to, to, come on, people, you can, there, we can all work together. We can be better listeners as That's well as better thing. communicators. Yes. We have that responsibility as listeners as well. But mm -hmm. that is probably a topic for It's a whole nother show. Yeah. We'll come back <laughs> and talk about that later. Yeah. For me, yeah. it's a lot about, yeah, it's, you do what you can do for yourself to make yourself comprehensible. I do the same thing in Spanish, right? A lot of so the times I. I, I think it's me. And then later I realize, oh no, I, somebody will say, no, you said it fine. And the other person just wasn't picking up what I was putting down. And so, yeah, we can all be better listeners too. That's a whole nother topic. Let's definitely definitely come it back is. and talk about it that. Is. Yeah. But before we say goodbye, can you tell people where to find you? Maybe talk a little bit about the programs that you're offering a little bit so in case people want to work sure. with you. Sure. Sure. So I'm at the, I'm the accent channel. That's me. I serve two populations. So I have students that I, I don't, my caseload is full and I have a wait list, but I have a resource on my website. If people are looking to find a qualified speech coach, they can find it there. And, and I can, if you have a place to put a link, I can give you that. So you can find that there. And then I also help speech and language professionals train to become accent specialists and to build either a side gig or a business that they love doing this amazing work. So I do that as well. Um, and if that's something, if you're, if you have an interest in speech and language, we talked about some of the people who are a good fit for this work, speech pathologists, ESL teachers, actors, voice coaches, but really anyone who has an interest in speech and language and enjoys teaching and working with people, then if you're interested in accent coaching, I have a program for that. So again, you can find the link. I'll give you that. Or 
go to my website, The Accent Channel. Woohoo. Awesome. Yes. Because I think we, you and I are very parallel in what we do and who we work with. And some people I think in this field are very much a lone wolf and they, they aren't into the collaboration thing. And what I love is that you're like, oh yeah, let's get together. Let's talk about these things. And I think now we're discovering, yeah, let's talk more about some other stuff too, because it's, it's not I, a competition. It's not a competition. We need more of this because it just feels good to talk to someone who understands. <laughs> and I firmly believe that as far as students, people are drawn to, they're drawn to our expertise to some extent, but more Mm. than anything, it's personality. There are people that are going to love the way I teach. And Mm -hmm. there are people who are going to say, I don't like that. (laughs) And I think that even as consumers, there are different styles and different teaching styles, different personalities, Mm -hmm. um, different ways of learning. And there's a place for all of us. Absolutely. But I do. I think the collaboration mm-hmm. is definitely needed in yeah. our little community. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a small enough community where we don't need, we don't need any more segmentation. I think we need more, more is more, I think in this case. And I know yeah. that I'm not everybody's cup of tea and that's fine. And I think that we all have our strengths and weaknesses, that's which is great too. because we can all find the people that are like our people. And I think at the end of the day, that's what it's about is learning from somebody or with somebody that you really feel comfortable with. And I know that we refer people to other people all the time and I'll say, oh, that's not really my thing. Or I think you might fit better with one of these other people. And that feels really good. I know. I, I'm sure that's it the does. case with you too, because you have your directory. And that that establishes you as an expert as well. I think the students are so grateful. Mm. I Just quickly, I, to, to prove that point, I remember specifically doing an assessment on a student who I never heard from the person again. And I thought, okay, I didn't do so well on that one. This mm. was years ago. This person sent me four or five refer. They sent referrals. So I, they never scheduled a session with me, never worked with me, never mm-hmm. heard from them again. But they sent other people. So I don't know. Sometimes it's just, you're not a good fit, but it doesn't mean they don't appreciate what you do. Exactly. Exactly. So I think there's room for all of us. I think that it's not that we all want a slice of the pie. It's that the pie is getting bigger and bigger with this world that we live in now and that we all need better communication skills or, or let's say multiple ways of speaking. And like you said, even us as native speakers, we often change our accents. Maybe it's for, for professional work. Maybe Absolutely. it's, yeah, maybe it's like for our personal goal. It's just for fun. But I think we can all talk more about this. It's my passion. I'm really happy to have you here today and talk about it. And Good, let's I'm definitely so get together to again. With you. Yay. Yes, definitely. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so awesome. much for doing this. This is totally. great. Thank Absolutely. You. Great. So we'll talk to you again soon. And, and thanks All again right. for coming today. Awesome. If you found this episode helpful in any way, please subscribe and leave a review. It's actually really helpful to me. Now, before I go, I have two tasks for you to do. First, I want you to register and come to my free monthly masterclass. They're on the last Thursday of the month. In just one hour, you're going to master a specific American accent skill. For example, the TH sound or rhythm. The Zoom registration link actually changes each month. So the second and maybe more important thing I want to ask you to do is to sign up for my mailing list because you're going to get the registration link each month and you're going to get bonus materials before and after the masterclass that I only send to my email list subscribers. The email opt-in link is down in the show notes. Be sure to sign up for my mailing list and come to the monthly masterclass for free. I'm Bianca, your personal American accent coach, and I want you to know that your voice is your choice. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the show. I'll see you in the next episode. Bye for now.